I didn't have some big conversion moment. I wanted to be uh, do physics since I was pretty young, since I figured out what physics was probably when I was in middle school. Uh, I started doing cosmology in graduate school because of all the different things that I could specialize in, I thought, now that is a field for generalists. I didn't want to sit and uh, become the world's expert on some tiny little area of science. I wanted to do something where I could uh, learn about all kinds of different things. And cosmology seemed like the, the branch of physics which, which pulled together the most uh, different kinds of ideas and different kinds of, different kinds of physics into one topic. So I uh, started doing that. Well, I started uh, working with the ACT collaboration uh, from the beginning of, uh, of when we originally proposed it to the NSF back in 2003, I guess it was. Uh, I was an assistant professor at Rutgers at the time. I'd done some theoretical predictions for the kind of signals we might be interested in looking for. And uh, at Rutgers, we were partners in a, a large optical telescope called the SALT Telescope in South Africa. And uh, the idea was, well, that would be a nice telescope to use to follow up all the galaxy clusters that we'll find in ACT and, and get redshifts for them. Um, so they asked me to join the collaboration. Probably the biggest prize that we're going after is uh, a signal from the earliest moments of the universe. Uh, we have good reason to believe that uh, there was this explosive event at early times called inflation in the early universe. And that would have happened when the universe was, was almost unimaginably young, something like a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second old. Uh, but the remarkable thing about it is that if this explosive event took place, it would have generated uh, a background of gravitational waves over an enormous range of length scales that would still be visible today, that would still exist today in the universe. Uh, and so one of the big motivations for doing this experiment is to see if we can see that signal. And the way we're trying to see it is that this, this sea of gravitational waves uh, will induce a very particular kind of subtle polarization signal in the microwave sky that we're looking at. Um, the hard part is that this signal is, is very tiny and very subtle. We're looking for variations in the, in the polarization of the microwave sky that are parts in 10 million or parts in 100 million. Um, some of my collaborators and I wrote the first paper about this uh, when, I was, when I was a postdoc. And I remember working out this idea and thinking, wow, that's a, that's a, a very interesting idea. Uh, it's too bad that it's so tiny that I, I can't imagine ever seeing this signal. Um, but like a lot of theorists, I've sort of learned the lesson that uh, even if you imagine something is, is completely uh, impossible to see. My brilliant experimental colleagues will, if it's interesting enough, they will go to work and and to figure out uh, incredibly innovative ways to push the boundaries on what we can actually see. So now we stand at what I feel like may be the precipice of, of seeing this signal sometime in the next five to ten years. And I think that Simon's Observatory has a very good chance of being the experiment that does it big part of Simon's Observatory is, is figuring out how can we tell the difference between this fabulous signal uh, that's going to tell us about the, the origin of everything and uh, a signal that's due to all kinds of, of messy physics that are relatively nearby distances in our own galaxy. That turns out to be very challenging, but not impossible. Those two signals have different uh, spectral signatures, and so if we measure in enough different frequencies, we think we're going to be able to tell the difference down to a very interesting level. It's really a multi-purpose experiment. We look at the microwave sky and we see all kinds of signals uh, in the microwave sky, and one signal that I've gotten very interested in lately is on the other end of the cosmic spectrum. Instead of being a signal that's coming from the very earliest moments of, of the universe, it's a signal that's coming from uh, 
sort of the nearest by uh, interesting objects that there might be uh, out there, which is uh, planets in our own solar system. In the past five years, uh, there's been a very interesting discovery that uh, small objects in our solar system called Kuiper Belt objects of which uh, Pluto is one of the examples, and, and Sedna, and, and some other smaller objects, uh, they orbit further away than, than Neptune does. And uh, most of these objects have only been discovered it really in the last decade. And as they were discovered, it was realized uh, that the properties of their orbits are strange. And if they were left to their own devices, they would not be in the kinds of orbits that are seen. Their orbits are lined up with each other in unusual ways. And uh, so there were uh, several different, uh, or a couple of different dynamicists who study orbits of things, uh, including a guy named Konstantin Batygin at Caltech, who proposed that uh, these unusual alignments of the Kuiper Belt objects, the way their orbits are aligned, can be explained if there's another planet out there uh, whose gravitational pull is sufficient to uh, shepherd these things around in a way uh, to keep them all aligned. A few different astronomers have developed uh, predictions for what the orbital properties of this new planet might be, which has now been called Planet Nine because it would be the, the ninth planet in the solar system. And the interesting thing about Planet Nine is uh, it's very difficult to see in optical light. It's far enough away that the light it reflects from the sun, it makes it extremely faint. But uh, the planetary scientists tell us that it should probably be at a temperature of about 40 degrees above absolute zero. And if it's 40 degrees above absolute zero, it will give off enough thermal radiation that we should be able to clearly see it with the Simons Observatory Telescope, which has not been designed to look for planets, uh, but which is just designed to see any kind of signals from the microwave sky, and the emission from this planet would be one of those signals. Discovering a new planet and discovering a signal from the early moments of the universe would be really wonderful kinds of cosmic bookend discoveries uh, that we have the potential for, for doing. You've got to be very driven by a, a desire to do this field. As you say, it's, uh, it's a difficult field. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of study. Uh, and you don't get rich doing it. But you do get to think about absolutely amazing ideas and get to work with some of the most cutting edge technology that exists and get to work with some of the most brilliant people you'll ever meet. So it's a fantastically rewarding career if you're really motivated to do it. Um, I think one of the challenges for young scientists is figuring out, well, what am I going to do? There's all these different kinds of science that I can do. Uh, so you have to figure out what really drives you. Um, before long in graduate school, you realize that uh, being a successful scientist is really not about just uh, doing what someone tells you to do, but you have to start coming up with your own ideas of, of what to do. And so sometimes I have students ask me, well, you know, what should I work on? And I think it's important to, to work on a, a variety of things. You have to earn your keep. You have to work on things like aspects of this experiment where there's a very clear path to achieving a goal, and you sit down and you work on it and you do something. But I always tell students you should always have a project in your back pocket that if it works out, it'll win you a Nobel Prize. And put a little bit of time into that.